Hello. Uh, the aim of this sort of web seminar is to provide you with a opportunity to put the theoretical knowledge that you've learned so far uh, into practical use. Now, the, the, in order for, to, for you to get the most out of this, you should have already by now read the relevant chapter from um, the textbook. So if you haven't read the chapter five of the textbook, please uh, read that and then come back to this video because um, that chapter will provide most of the kind of um, the, the teachings. But now here, what I'm going to do is kind of go through some examples and give you a chance to kind of have a seminar-like experience, but only online. Um, okay, so the problem with uh, teaching how to reconstruct arguments is that this is the kind of thing that's very difficult to teach, but you should, the, the best way to learn it is to uh, go, go through, through pra practice. And that's why, um, as I said, the focus will be here on, on example, examples. Um, and I will ask you to pause the video at various points so that you could kind of then think about the questions or think about the text or think about the, 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 sh the short assignments that I give you and then come back to the video and then see uh, how your uh, answers are similar or different from what I came up. Um, so the problem that we have to solve is that um, in, the, in the first part of the course, when you were dealing with arguments, you usually had a very kind of formalized, simple premise one, premise two, conclusion type argument. Uh, but the problem is that you know, most people don't talk like that and most people don't uh, present their opinions like that. What the, we usually get is a longer text full of examples, explanations, um, all sorts of rhetoric, ret rhetorical tricks, uh, maybe things that provide background um, and so on and so on. So um, what we aim to find is take this longer piece of text or any kind of, uh, you know, any kind of text that isn't this formalized premise one, premise two kind of argument and then find the argument from that. Now first, uh, a couple of things to keep in mind before we uh, start with the process. Um, there are often implicit premises in the text. So things that um, the, the author has in mind or things that the author needs in order to arrive at their conclusion, but they aren't explicitly stated in the, in the argument. And I'll point out uh, along the, the examples that we go through um, where those implicit premises are and maybe what might be um, ways out to find that. Uh, one thing, uh, to keep in mind is that if you think about the context of where the argument is presented, what, what's the discussion that the author is trying to contribute to, um, what might be some of the background texts or background assumptions or background kind of knowledge that the author assumes that the reader has, then these, th these things will help you uh, find the um, implicit um, uh, premises. Uh, the second thing to keep in mind is that we aim to be charitable. We aim, aim to be generous. We aim to find the best version of the, of the argument that's in the text. So if there's, if there's multiple ways to read a text, then we should try to find the best possible version of the argument from the text. Because um, unless, otherwise, you know, if, if you kind of aim to look for the weakest version, then, you know, um, the argument that you then encounter isn't uh, kind of, it might not be worthy of discussion. Um, uh, the third thing to, th to say is that um, if, you, if we look at a, a text or, or an image or whatever, then sometimes it's very easy to find the argument from there. It's very easy to, to kind of translate uh, a long essay or something into this formalized premise one, premise two, conclusion type of argument. But the fact that it's easy doesn't mean necessarily that um, the argument itself is a very good one and also vice versa. So if it's very difficult to find the argument then it doesn't necessarily mean that the argument is bad. It just means that the argument isn't very well uh, presented. Okay, so let's go to our first example. Uh, and this example is a, is a very, very short um, essay that I wrote uh, for this course as an example 
Um, so this is, in that sense, it's a fictional essay, but it's based on a real uh, thesis that was um, defended uh, in the Department of Philosophy. Um, so this is like, but it's meant to be merely as an example and it shouldn't be taken too seriously. Um, so I will ask you now to pause the video and then read the essay. And then once you've done that, then uh, come back and I'll kind of start with the kind of unpacking and, and the questions part. Now, once we've read the essay and then we now go into trying to um, reconstruct the, the argument that the author is uh, presenting, then as you read already in the textbook, the first step, the first question is we would have to find out, we would have to ask, what's the thesis? Like what's the main conclusion that the author is trying to convince us? So we, we need to get a sense of what is the one main thing that the author is trying to convey? Um, and then once we have that, we can start reconstructing the uh, individual kind of parts of that argument and then the parts of those so smaller sub arguments and so on. So my first question to you is to think about uh, and then maybe write it down or say out, out loud uh, what you think the main thesis or the main point of this uh, essay is. For us, in this case, the author made it uh, quite easy. Um, the, the final paragraph of the essay clearly demonstrates that what the author is interested in, the conclusion that they want to arrive at, is that we should stop eating meat. Now, the second question is, what are the kind of individual, kind of uh, smaller uh, sub-arguments that they present in favor of this position? And, and then the, and the, in the first step, we are just looking merely for the very general kinds of um, labels or very, very general, um, get a, we're looking for, to get a general sense of which part of the text serves which purpose. Um, and I think that if we are being generous to the author, we can find four different arguments that they present in favor of their position that we should stop eating meat. So um, take a moment, uh, read the text maybe again, uh, and try to figure out what those four general arguments might be, and then we will look at each one of them more specifically. I mean, it seems to me that the, the four possible arguments that we could try to find from the text uh, is first, the argument about uh, future people or future generations. Uh, secondly, the argument about the kind of creatures animals are. The third argument is about the impact of the environment or the kind of the, the waste of resources. And then the fourth argument is the health impact that eating meat has. So now let's look at each one of them in turn and then like look how from the text we get the argument and then what my, we might say about the argument. Okay, so we know the conclusion the author wants to arrive at is that we shouldn't eat meat. Um, and then, then the, the first sub argument or the first kind of uh, part is that the argument that relies on this future generations. So what does the um, author say in the text which might support um, this conclusion? And what are, what are kind of the steps that they take and how do they connect those steps? And you know, what are the things that they mention? So um, take a second and think about, you know, in terms of the, the future generations and the conclusion that we shouldn't eat meat, what are the things that the author says and how do they connect those things uh, with each other and the conclusion? And remember that there might be certain implicit premises that the author relies upon, but that doesn't really explicitly state. Like, obviously there are various ways we could interpret the text, but it seems to me that the argument about future people uh, would look like the reconstruction of the argument would look something like this. Uh, step one, that we look back at people in, in the past and we judge them for their practices. Uh, step two, people in the future will look back at us and judge us for our practices. Uh, step three, one of those practices is the practice of eating meat. Uh, and then comes the conclusion, uh, therefore, we should stop eating meat. Um, 
Obviously, if you like now look at this argument uh, as I've reconstructed it, you will see that there's um, like one step missing, and that's the implicit um, premise, which is that we don't want to be judged. So we have the, the fact that we judge people in the past. We can assume that people in the future will be judging us. Um, one of the things that they will be judging us is um, that fa the fact that we eat meat. Uh, we don't want to be judged. That's the implicit premise that isn't stated but is assumed. And therefore, we have reason to stop eating meat. Um, now, the second step now is to figure out, you know, what can we say about this argument? You know, does, does this argument make any, any sense to us? So um, take a second and think about whether you think that the premises are true or not. Um, and does the author provide any reason to think that the, those premises are true? Or are those premises merely uh, stated? Given that this argument is something that's found in the introductory paragraph, there isn't really much that the author provides in, in terms of um, uh, much explanation or, or explanation or evidence. Um, and one major comment that uh, I might have about this, if somewhere, someone were to submit this essay to me, is that the, the, this argument already assumes its conclusion in the premises. Because um, the future generations can't judge us um, for eating meat, unless eating meat is something that's bad. And thus, the argument doesn't really uh, provide any new reason to think that we have reason not to eat meat. OK, so let's look at the, the second uh, argument that we, might, that we can find in the text. Uh, so this um, now relates to the kind of creatures, animals that we eat are. So uh, take a second and think about um, how we might reconstruct this line of thought and whether there are, might be any implicit premises uh, in play. Uh, it seems to me that if we read only the text, then the, the argument that we could reconstruct goes something like this. Animals are both uh, emotional and conscious creatures. Uh, therefore, animals deserve respect. Uh, and then the conclusion is that we should stop eating animals or we should stop eating meat. Um, again, we can see that there are implicit premises that aren't stated but are needed in order to make this um, um, argument work. First of all, we need the implicit premise that um, creatures that are emotional creatures deserve respect. And secondly, we need the implicit premise that creatures are, that are conscious creatures deserve respect. And then thirdly, we need the, the, the final step that uh, respecting a creature means not eating them. Uh, okay, so now that we have the argument, I'm asking you again to pause the video and then think about the, think about the premises, whether the author provides any um, explanations or any proof uh, in order for us, to, in order to convince the reader in those premises. Again, it should be fairly easy to see that the premises are merely stated and, and not really demonstrated. Um, and also, um, I think it seems to me that the argument is, is pretty weak since a, um, the, the, the claim to being emotional conscious uh, animals doesn't seem to include all the animals we eat. So it seems that the argument, even, even if it were a good argument, doesn't prove enough. And also it might prove too much because if we think that animals are uh, conscious and emotional uh, creatures and deserve our respect, then, th then th that raises the question of what we would do uh, in terms of the vermin or insects and so on. Okay, so now we come to the more meaty uh, arguments in the text. So first is the argument about the environment. Um, so take a moment and think about how you might rephrase or reconstruct the argument that is presented uh, in the text concerning the environment. Now my version of this is goes something like this, that raising cattle uses a lot of water. Raising, that, that's step one. Step two is that raising um, cattle produces lots of waste, uh, which is harmful for the environment. Um, step three, raising cattle produces lots of uh, greenhouse gases, which are also, again, um, harmful for the environment. Therefore, raising cattle is harmful for the environment. And then that gives us the conclusion that we, shouldn't, we should stop eating meat. Uh, 
Um, there is one implicit premise here that's missing, um, and that's that we should we should not harm the environment. Uh, now, take a moment and think about what might be uh, some problems with this this argument um, as it's been as it's now been reconstructed by us. Hopefully, you noticed that the this argument, as it is presented, um, mm, does of course explain its premises and it, it does provide some empirical evidence to believe that those premises are true, but um, those premises concern how, the, how meat is pre being produced and it doesn't really uh, address the issue of eating meat. So if cattle were raised differently, so it wouldn't be using that much water and it wouldn't be using, uh, generating this much uh, waste and, uh, and greenhouse gases, then the argument seems to fall apart um, and then kind of the reason for stopping eating meat also goes away. And then finally, uh, the, the fourth argument in this first example, so take a moment and think about what, how you might um, reconstruct the argument concerning uh, health impact, and then we'll see what we can learn from that. My version uh, would go something like this, that the way cattle is uh, raised uses a lot of hor hormones and chemicals. These chemicals and hormones are transferred into humans when we eat meat. Step three is that chemicals are harmful. These chemicals are harmful for humans. Um, therefore, we can get a, a midway conclusion that eating meat is harmful. Um, and then, therefore, we should stop eating meat. Uh, see if you can spot where there's an implicit uh, premise missing and what it might be. It seems to me that the, the premise that isn't stated but it's, is required for the argument to work is that we should not engage in harmful things. Uh, and that's not necessarily an obvious uh, premise because people do engage in harmful things all the time. Okay, now that we have the, reconstructed the argument, then um, see if you can notice anything wrong with the argument or whether there's something that we, once we analyze it, we see that might not be. Just like with the, the previous argument, we'll see, we, what we see here is that the argument is actually against the way meat is being produced and not against the mere fact of eating meat. So now that we um, analyzed the, the whole text, what we saw that there are four possible arguments that we could reconstruct uh, that all aim to support the conclusion that we shouldn't uh, eat meat. Uh, we found that one of those arguments, once it's reconstructed, uh, is uh, somewhat circular. We found that one of the, the second of those arguments um, isn't really fully explained and might not uh, be uh, right or appropriate for the uh, author's purposes. And then uh, two last arguments um, really didn't prove what the author wanted to prove. They merely proved that the way meat is being produced is, is bad and not necessarily that eating meat is bad. Okay, so what can we then kind of um, learn from these uh, short exercises? So first, of course, as a kind of reminder, we try to identify what's the main thesis, what's the main conclusion. Uh, then we looked at which kind of like which general parts of the text serve which function. Uh, then we looked at each a specific part and asked what's being said in this part that's meant to support the final conclusion. Then we looked at what are, um, what kind of implicit premises are in play, what are the additional steps that are required to make the conclusions that the author wants to make. Uh, then we looked at how these premises and uh, um, conclusions are connected. Do these premises actually lead to the conclusion that's being wanted? And then we kind of gave some assessments uh, of these arguments. Now it's important to remember that even though um, in this particular text, the way we reconstructed these arguments, we found that those arguments weren't very good uh, in supporting the conclusion, this doesn't mean that the conclusion isn't true. There still might be very good reasons for um, not eating meat, but that's not really uh, at issue for us here. Okay. So now let's look at 
uh, another example. And this is, um, uh, in some sense, a polar opposite because, uh, as you can see, this is just a, um, a photo. It's a tweet uh, of somebody um, which just includes one, one sentence, a couple of hashtags, and some photos. Um, so the first kind of step would be to, um, because the kind of, there's much less content here, then I think um, here what we need to do is first establish kind of the context, uh, establish what's under discussion. So uh, take a moment and think about um, what is the kind of topic uh, that this uh, photo is trying to address. Uh, what kind of what's the discussion that it's being that it aims to contribute to? It should be fairly obvious that the topic here is uh, sexual assault or assault in general. Um, so, in order to make sense of the argument, in order to kind of see what the author is trying to say, we need to add in some knowledge first about the discussion as it as as it is as it kind of exists in the society. But also we need to in, add in facts that we know about uh, the, these people. But the question now is that given that we know that this um, argument is supposed to be about sexual assault, uh, then the question is what's the main thesis, what's the main conclusion that the author is trying to convince us of? So take a moment and think about what the thesis might be. Uh, now it seems to me that uh, one way to phrase this is that what the author is trying to, trying to argue for is that the common claim about uh, allegations of assault uh, ruining, ruining someone's career is false. Okay, now that we know that's the, the conclusion that the author wants to arrive at, um, look at the photo again and think about what might be the argument or how we might reconstruct the argument. What are the kind of the steps? What are, what are some of the things that the author says that should somehow support that conclusion. Now, in my, in my version, I'd say that step one uh, is that there is a practice to uh, publicly uh, present allegations of sexual assault. Step two, um, we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't publicize these allegations because that has bad effects on people's reputation. And then the counterpoint is that um, that the, the, these different photos of these different people um, is, is meant to show that step three, Casey Affleck had allegations publicized and still has a reputation. Donald Trump had allegations um, publicized against him and still has a reputation. Uh, Woody Allen had allegations against himself but uh, still has a reputation. Uh, Chris Brown was um, accused but, but still has a reputation. And Roman Polanski, was, a, was similarly accused but still has a uh, reputation. Therefore, you can have allegations raised against you and still have reputation. Now that we have this ar argument, uh, think about some of the kind of questions we might ask about this argument uh, in terms of whether it's a good argument. So the three kind of questions that I would raise is that uh, first we have to kind of ask the, um, the empirical question of whether those people actually still have good reputations. Secondly, we have to ask whether these photos which depict people uh, getting awards or getting elected, whether the, these facts of getting awards has any relation to their um, reputation. And finally, we could ask, does like five examples really provide a sufficient case against a more general uh, claim? Okay, and now let's move on to a third example. So this is a, uh, a photo or kind of a, a this kind of image that I found on the internet um, supposedly presenting this uh, absolutely demolishing um, argument against those people who are against abortion. So look at the argument um, as it is presented and then think about how you might reconstruct that uh, text. So if you kind of learned from the previous uh, examples, so the first step would be to understand what is the main thesis. Um, and the main thesis, uh, like the way I see it, is to say that um, there is a difference between a baby and an embryo. And because there is a difference, uh, 
um, you know, we have abortion should be then uh, allowed, or at least the, the, the claim that the anti-abortion people make um, that they are equal doesn't hold. And the way I reconstructed the argument would go something like this, that step one, uh, pro-life people assume that embryo and baby have equal moral, uh, have equal moral status. Um, this is something that we would need to add in from the context if we think about what's the discussion that's being addressed here. Uh, step two, dropping a petri dish or a baby on the floor would damage them. This is something we can assume from common sense. Uh, step three, something that has moral status shouldn't be damaged. This is something that comes from the definition of having moral status. Step four, if two things have equal moral status, then we cannot choose between them. And this is something that author claims. Step five, if you have to choose between damaging uh, an embryo and damaging a baby, you would choose to damage the embryo. This is again something that the author claims. Step six, um, so you can choose between uh, a baby and an embryo. This is something we can derive from premise five. And then finally, um, if we, there, because we can choose between them, um, that means that they don't have equal uh, moral status. Okay, now that we have this argument, we can start um, assessing it. So take a moment and think about um, whether you think that there are, might be any uh, flaws or any kind of uh, questions that could be raised. If we formalize premises uh, five, six, and seven, then we can see that it's a uh, modus tollens kind of argument. So we know that it's valid. But now we have to look at the premises. Um, it seems to me that premises one, two, and three um, are fairly likely to be true. Um, and also premises uh, five. And if that's true, then also premise six is true. So the main question is premise four, that if two things have equal moral status, then we cannot choose between them. Uh, and that's something that we can question. Uh, it seems that there are lots of ways to choose thing between things that have equal moral status um, because we ha might have additional reasons. Um, and, and more importantly, even if the, the argument is successful in proving that the embryo and the baby don't have equal moral status, then that doesn't necessarily mean that the embryo itself is uh, worthless and then therefore being uh, okay for it to be aborted. Okay, so this has been like three short examples on how we might now apply these uh, theoretical knowledge that you've learned uh, from the textbook and previous lectures on how we can actually take specific uh, instances of texts and then finding the arguments, restating the arguments, and then assessing the arguments. Okay, thank you.